but I, I developed sort of a theory, I think, as to why music is so important in our spiritual traditions. And as we've been talking about this, in when we think about how the universe is apparently created out of oneness, when you create out of oneness, you have to create in pairs of opposites. <laughs> so we get space against time. We get electrons against protons. Uh, the whole thing comes out in these pairs of opposites, but that they're not exactly opposite, so that you don't get the whole thing just disappearing in an instant. Uh, and it's interesting in space and time, and again, you can't really talk about this in terms that we can understand because we're living in space and time. And space and time comes out with the creation. So all of our analogies are in space and time. So they don't quite work. But if you can think of it this way, if you're up against a mirror and you want to see yourself, you have to back off. <laughs> you have to separate yourself. And so this act of creation where Brahman wants to know itself and become the subject and the object, there's some sort of a separation. And it's interesting, space actually does seem to have, we usually think of three dimensions of space, but you can actually think of it as two, an inward and an outward. <laughs> you can either get closer or you can get further away. You can think of it as the infinite trying to be as big as possible, and the oneness or the undividedness is trying to be all in one place. So we have these two directions, you could say, in space against the one direction of time. Time always seems to go in one direction. Uh, so it's this interesting kind of stretching uh, of the universe that then creates this vibrational energy which permeates the whole thing. And in uh, those of you that are familiar with stringed instruments like the guitar, uh, if you pluck the string, it goes up and down. You can't pluck it just up. <laughs> if you pluck it up, it'll go up and down. So everything that you create out of oneness, it gets created in pairs of opposites by necessity, and it then has this vibrational nature to it. And light is, in some sense, the conversion factor, you could say, between space and time. We see things away from us in space and backward in time, and light waves connect everything. So literally, let there be light is that creative event where space and time are created, and light keeps it all interconnected. And light is an electromagnetic, electromagnetic wave. The electric wave goes in one plane, the magnetic wave goes in the other, and it has the direction in, uh, through time. So you've got an interesting model here that shows us that there must be a vibrational nature to the universe. But light is not the best metaphor for a vibrational universe because it was centuries of civilized investigation before we even figured out light had wave properties or what light was really about. But sound is something that we can experience very immediately and produce. We can both produce and hear sound and we can feel the vibrations. We can see the vibrations if you uh, speak towards, say, a, a, a still body of water. You can see the, the vibrations. You can see the vibrations of a drum. You can see the vibrations on a string. So it's something that we can perceive very directly and understand. So as a metaphor for a vibrational universe, uh, music and sound are, are really the best thing we've got going for us. Now, we've been talking so much today about how this creation comes out of oneness. And again, sound is this marvelous uh, symbol for that because uh, our whole uh, sound structure, our symbolism of sound comes from, I wish this little pointer worked, but it doesn't, does it? It just disappears when you get it on the screen. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, well, the mouse actually, yeah, it does, doesn't it? All right. If you play a very low note on a musical instrument, it creates overtones. Uh, overtones are higher pitched uh, musical tones, and they're all related to the fundamental tone. And then if you translate those tones down into, the, into one octave, you get the whole octave, you get the whole scale. 
So in a very literal sense, all the music is contained in one sound, one note. One note produces all of the other notes. You just have to translate them down into an octave that you can perceive. So this is the, uh, uh, what's called the natural chord or the overtone series. The first overtone is an octave higher and then a fifth higher than that and then a fourth higher than this, which is another octave here. So you get a C, C, G, C, if you're familiar with music. Uh, and then the next overtone is a third up from that. And these overtones, the reason that they are the natural, naturally produced, has to do with the wave frequencies fitting in a particular space. I think that's our next slide, I hope. <laughs> Oh, no, we have an ohm, all right. So, so we're going to have an ohm sound, and we've been hearing that a lot today. So literally, the whole spectrum of sounds comes out of one sound, and that's the symbol of the ohm, is that you've got ah, ooh, uh, mm, symbolizing the whole spectrum of sounds we can create, and literally the whole scale is also created out of the ohm. And it's interesting, ohm literally means... Uh, Ah, this is the overtone series, sorry. So let me back up just a little. Um, you're going to hear the, the lower pitch and then you're going to hear the sequence of overtones. talking about things being omniscient and omnipresent. The om of those words literally means all. That's the Latin root for all. And so here we have the om being the all sounds and the source of all creation. And it's, it's the, a Latin root as well for the same kind of meaning. So uh, the next thing I wanted to show you is these wave patterns. So if this were your fundamental wave down here on the bottom, uh, if you wanted to fit twice as many waves, that would be the next one. Or uh, if you wanted a 4 to 1 ratio or an 8 to 1 ratio and so forth, those are producing those other various pitches in there. So each pitch is simply a, a different number of frequencies being fitted into the same space. Now, another interesting symbol for vibrations is the symbol of uh, something falling into a body of water. And this is frequently used as an image in religious uh, myths and metaphors of the idea of creation, where there's uh, utter stillness and silence and this vast uh, ocean of, of oneness and undifferentiated. Sometimes it's described as darkness or the abyss or something of that nature. And then something comes to vibrate it or to uh, it f something falls into it. It's interesting that uh, in the Indo-European traditions there were many myths about uh, a goddess that came from the heavens as a, as a rock that falls into a body of water or a star that falls into a body of water. And these were variously known as Ishtar and Astarte and so forth. And our, the Christian name Easter actually comes from one of those goddess names and is associated with this creation type of event of some sort of object or star or rock falling into a body of water to begin the creation. And so if you uh, notice that as this drop falls into this still body of water, you get this ripple of waves coming out. Uh, so you now have, rather than oneness, you have differentiation, you have ups and downs in the creation of this vibra vibratory nature. Now this idea of circles and rods then becomes another 
universal symbol that we find all over the place uh, in various religious traditions indicating this uh, creative event. You, we find it in the Shiva Lingam. Uh, that comes up eventually. You also find it in uh, royal traditions. For example, the Queen of England even today will sit there and hold a staff and a globe <laughs> indicating her royal power, her symbols of authority. This idea that the, the rod and the circle are the fundamental elements of the universe in creating the whole universe is very, very ancient. You can find it in Egyptian pictures and uh, Babylonian pictures and so forth. And the Shiva Lingam is that same thing. You have a, a, a rod and a circle, basically, and this is the creative energy of the universe. It's almost identical to that picture of the drop falling into the still water and creating the ripples. Uh, so, uh, of course, the dance of Shiva is also a uh, different aspect of Shiva than we had in the last one, but in this aspect, we see that Shiva is dancing the creation and it's the rhythm of his dance that is the creative event, plus the rhythm of his little Dhammaru. So he's holding a little Dhammaru and uh, the sound of the Dhammaru is then the creative sound in the universe. So it's always confusing when you have to explain this to people that don't know anything about Hinduism and they think they've, they've read something and they think that Shiva's the god of destruction and then they see this and they don't understand it. So. You have to explain that each of these deities are like a window to the infinite, and anyone who worships a particular aspect begins to see all the aspects in that one. Uh, just like uh, the songs about Ganesha is, is really the Omkar and the totality and so forth. So worshippers of Ganesha see all of these aspects in Ganesha. So uh, it becomes rather complicated to explain in a short period of time. So. We have the Shiva Lingam as one symbol, we have the Shiva's dancing and the Shiva's drum as another symbol. So many symbols that have this idea of music as being some sort of creation from the deity. Here we have Krishna creating music with his flute. And of course the Greeks had Orpheus and Orpheus could do anything with his, the magic of his music. Uh, and then we have the goddess Saraswati who is the uh, goddess of music. She's the consort of Brahma, who's the creative aspect of the Godhead. And as a goddess figure, the goddess figures you probably have noticed are the ones that are more immediately involved in our worldly affairs. And so uh, Saraswati is symbolic of creating music and art and literature and knowledge and learning and crafts and all these creative endeavors that we do. And so as we do those kinds of activities in the world where we're manifesting that aspect of our divinity through those creative activities. Now, it's, as you also probably noticed, especially in Indian music, there's uh, almost a universal tendency to have a drone going on during the music, whether it's in the Tampura or somewhere else on the harmonium, you have a drone. And that's like the, the constant ohm or that one sound out of which all the other sounds relate. So everything is relating back to the oneness uh, through the musical symbolism. So as we're singing and creating this music, uh, it's symbolically representing how the oneness is always there, and it, but it has the ability to create all this this wonderful diversity. Uh, now another interesting analogy that we can use with music to understand the creation is that we often say, well, the world is unreal, uh, but it's all Brahman, so it has to have an aspect of reality in it. And, it, and Brahman doesn't change. Well, how can that be? Well, it's sort of like a musical instrument. You see, the musical instrument is like Brahman. It just sits there. <laughs> but you can create all sorts of music temporarily, and it gets created, and then it just disappears into the ethers <laughs> and is not there anymore. And the instrument's still the same. Hopefully, if you didn't play it too roughly, the instrument's still the same. 
So it's another way that we can understand how Brahman and Maya can be related, that you can actually, Brahman can create the universe uh, and yet remain unchanged. And how everything can be filled with Brahman and yet it remains unchanged. Now, different instruments have different timbers or qualities to them because of the way they're structured and each instrument will have a different overtone emphasis. And so whether it's an Indian instrument or a Western instrument or some other kind of instrument, depending on the shape and the, the kind of material that is used to make the instrument, different overtones will be emphasized when you play a note. So, for example, this is an oboe, and an oboe tends to emphasize some of the higher harmonics that uh, give it sort of an edge. This is a saxophone that has a, uh, yet again, a, a different timbre. And then the human voice, and different voices have different timbres. Now that's uh, the Saraswati Raga used in, uh, turned into a bhajan about Saraswati. So uh, we have all of these, uh, in Indian music, which some of you are a lot more familiar with and knowledgeable about than, than I am, but just for the benefit of the summary, uh, each scale is symbolic of a particular kind of energy. And uh, you use the notes of those scales to evoke a certain kind of quality. And so the, the music is structured so that you can evoke uh, something that's appropriate for the morning or appropriate for the evening or appropriate for meditation or appropriate for contemplation and so forth. Or, or that will evoke a particular deity. And it's interesting, again, this is uh, an idea that crops up in other traditions as well. In Africa, uh, they use different drumming patterns to evoke the energies of different deities. Uh, Indian music has uh, a lot of uh, rhythmic and melodic uh, development. And, but everything is related back to that one uh, tone, the one tonic tone of the piece. In Western music, they didn't develop the melodic and rhythmic components to that kind of degree because they sort of got sidetracked with harmony. <laughs> and harmony became another way of expressing some of these same things. And in harmony, what you do is, again, you're relating things back to a tonic tone, but you can have shifts of harmony into different keys, and the keys are related to the original key and so forth. So it's a different way of symbolizing the variety of how sound can be manifested out of, out of a key or a home, a home sound. Oops, what did I do here? I think we're almost done with these pictures. Yeah, we have just different pictures of Saraswati here. <clears throat> so, let's see how we're doing. All right. All right, so for these reasons, I find that music is really a, a powerful symbol, and I think that's why it's so uh, frequently used as part of spiritual practices. Again, we'll have a quote uh, from Swami Abedananda. He, he says, the moods and temperaments of people are reflected in their music, which is called the magic of sound. Music gives expression of joy, grief, pleasure and pain, love and hatred, and it has always been an important element of culture of the people of all nations. But in spite of variations, we find some links between music and the divine nature of the universe. Now it's interesting that we find, again, across traditions, that music seems to provide three roles, entertainment, healing, and spiritual teaching. So the, whether it's a bard or a shaman or a musician or a spiritual figure, uh, these elements will frequently be intertwined, or one might be emphasized over the other. You have the troubadours of France, and the skalds of Norway, and the African uh, griots, and the Navajo singers, uh, and the 
um, Indian Magad, uh, Magad does. And the shamans from all over the world really have used these kinds of things as healing and entertainment. And of course, healing and spirituality go uh, hand in hand as well. The idea that your wholeness, if it's properly reflected, will uh, help to heal you. In the Bible, we have examples of Samuel, who is both a great teacher and a singer. Singing songs is frequently used to help us remember things. And of course, all of the Vedas were chanted and are chanted because that's a much easier way to remember it than if you just tried to speak it out. And this is similar in, in other traditions. For example, the Psalms in the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition are sung because it's easier to remember things when you put them to a tune. I used to do that as a kid. I'd have these lists of things I had to memorize for history, and I'd, I'd put them into a tune so I could remember them. <laughs> In the Rig Veda, it says the primordial rhythm and primal sounds are fused into a rustling song of praise that encouraged creation to grow and prosper. And Swami Abedananda says, the science of music was first developed by the Hindus from the chanting of the Vedic hymns. The Sama Veda was especially meant for music and it is the source of all types of music that evolved in the post-Vedic times. The most ancient of these hymns are, rec uh, are recorded in the Veda called the Rig Veda. Rig meaning hymn and Veda meaning knowledge. Knowledge that came to them through revelation in the forms of these hymns. And when these hymns are put into music, they are used to chant and sing them at the time of their ritual and ceremonial services and in sacrifices and so forth. And that particular hymn, when put into music, is called Sama Veda. In the Aitiriya Upanishad, rhythms are compared to horses. As one travels with horses or oxen to reach a terrestrial goal, one needs rhythms and meters to reach heavenly goals. Of Brahma, it is said, he meditated a hundred thousand years and the result of his meditation was the creation of sound and music. So you can see we have a, a, a very strong tradition that sound and music are metaphorically the created creation events, you could say. Now, people can make fun of you if you say that. I, mean, I know it says in the scriptures, you know, that the universe is made out of sound, you know. <laughs> well, from the physical standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. In order to have sound, you have to have the vibrations of something there already. So you already have to have a universe before you can have sound. So in the liter again, if you try to take these metaphors literally, you can poke fun at them. But that's not really the meaning of that. The idea is that the universe is created out of vibration. And vibration is most easily understood by us as sound is because we can create it and hear it. So that's the meaning of, of the idea that the universe is created out of sound. It's not literally sound, it's, <laughs> it's vibration. Now, uh, Plato, a Greek philosopher, tells that the creator constructed the world soul according to musical intervals and proportions. And he spoke of the universe as the music of the spheres. And this was picked up by Pythagoras. And there was a whole Pythagorean school, a mystery school, relating numbers and music and the, the music of the spheres and how everything interrelated with those uh, kinds of uh, uh, symbols. Oh, another, another interesting thing that I should point out, which I kind of skipped over, when we talked about the the rod and the circle or the, the something falling into the water, a straight line and a circle being creative. It's interesting that our whole digital age is made up of zeros and ones. Uh, and literally zero and one represent the, the wholeness, which can also be thought of as no thingness because there's no individual thing or no corners on the zero. Uh, so in, as the Buddhists would say, it's uh, no thing. And then there's the one. And so you have the whole universe cre created out of zeros and ones in the digital sense. It's kind of another fun image that you can play with. 
So now every time you look at a computer and you're, you're getting impatient, you can start thinking, oh, all those zeros and ones, it's the creation of the whole universe in here. <laughs> I wish it would hurry up. <laughs> so you have to use, you know, instead of getting annoyed at it and hitting it with a hammer, you have to use these as spiritual opportunities. So, uh, going on here, we have in, uh, again, the Vedic creator god Prajapati uh, is said to be him and song personified. The rhythms are his limbs and the limbs of the god who created the world. This first sacrificial offering and the first gods were the meters, the various kinds of rhythms. And the seven arc fathers of mankind were also rhythms. So here again, we have a tradition that rhythms, uh, which are the basic, one basic component of music, uh, is fundamental to creation. And it's used to describe that process. Really, you have those three basic elements to work with in music. You have uh, rhythm, which is the most fundamental, melody, and then harmony. And so you can use any combination of those, if you have to have some sort of rhythm or you don't have anything. Uh, but then you can have rhythm by itself, or you can have it with a melody, and then you can have, add harmony to it if you want to. In the Nakamati Library, there was an, uh, an interesting passage that says, I am the word who dwells in the ineffable silence, and it, the sound, exists from the beginning in the foundations of the all. It is the foundation that supports every movement of the eons that belongs to the mighty glory. It is the breath of the powers. So that brings up another uh, important element about vibration as being a metaphor for creation. And that has to do with the control of breath and pranayama. And when you read some of Vivekananda's Raja Yoga, you clearly get this idea that by controlling the breath, you are controlling the rhythms and vibrations of your mind and your body, and then ultimately you, you can actually control things in the universe. So by getting hold of one vibration, you can get a hold of other vibrations. And musically, again, we have this idea. If you play a tone uh, loudly enough, anything in its vicinity that can vibrate to that frequency will vibrate <laughs> in that frequency uh, by resonance. So vibrations will, can cause other things to vibrate. And again, this gives us a good metaphor for how the different levels or, or realms of being could interact. So for example, vibrations in the the gross level can affect the causal level and the subtle level and vice versa. And we're trying to tap into the, those lines of energy. We're trying to tap into the uh, vibrations of holy beings. So we read their lives, we meditate on their pictures, uh, we picture their form in our mind. All of these are thought waves and those thought waves put you into a vibrational state where you can then uh, be in resonance <laughs> harmony with the energies of those people. And this then leads to mantras. The reason we use mantras, again, mantras are sound symbols of the divine. And it's interesting, when you, when you read the scriptures, you realize that there is an identity between the mantra and the deity. You know, sometimes people from the outside, they look at Hinduism and they see this sort of complicated collections of gods and goddesses that all look kind of odd and <laughs> they don't quite know what to make of it and they try to read descriptions of it and they don't quite tally and those <laughs> it gets very confusing. But you have to think of these as representative of energies, of archetypal energies. And when you think of it that way, a, a picture can vibrate with that energy, a yantra can vibrate with that energy, and a mantra can vibrate with that energy. And there's, uh, the scriptures say they are identical. There is no difference between uh, Rama and his name. <laughs> There's no difference between the deity and the yantra that you can draw as a geometric symbol. All of these things are identical because they are on a vibrational level putting you in resonance with 
the frequency of that archetypal energy. So you can think of it as impersonal, like a yantra, or you can think of it as personal, as having a particular human type of form. Now, the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna uh, would often tell you how important music was, as Ramakrishna did himself. For example, Swami uh, Brahmananda in the Internal Companion says, lose yourself day and night in contemplation, in singing his praises and glory. Only then will you be blessed with his vision. Dive deep, my children. And then he says, play with God, sing his glory and enjoy the fun. And so then, for example, the little uh, tune that Charlie shared with us, that's such an easy little tune to remember and it can go around and around in your head. And so then those words go around and around in your head. And so it's sort of the subliminal uh, pattern of uh, energy that's uh, now connected. And I know my choir members tell me that too when we learn a song. is oh, I've had that song going around in my head. <laughs> so if you sing a budget and it goes around in your head. And so the, those energies stay with you through the day. Swami Vivekananda said, music is the highest art and to those who understand is the highest worship. And Sri Ramakrishna said, one obtains the vision of God if one sings with a yearning heart. Sing about God realization songs expressing divine joy. Feel joyous and ecstatic as one chants God's name. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Psalms, it says, praise him with the sound of trumpet, praise him with the psalter and harp, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with stringed instruments and organs, praise him upon the loud cymbals, praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's also interesting to see, as we, as we mentioned, Saraswati is the, the goddess of learning arts and creation and the, the consort of Brahma and frequently sound or some deity in charge of music is thought of as the uh, creator uh, in, of the universe. And frequently it is said that the universe is created by chanting or singing or crying aloud or saying a word, or by pronunciation. So this is a very common idea. And as we mentioned earlier, this, this throat chakra is the, the one that's after the uh, energy of I, thou. This is the oneness, this is the I, thou energy. And this is the creation center, where your voice comes from. You're creating those vibrations of the universe. And so as we chant, whether you're just thinking of the chanting internally or whether you're doing it uh, audibly, uh, that vibration is still there, whether it's a subtle thought vibration or an actual physical vibration. And so places like this that have enjoyed so much uh, chanting and singing uh, build up a certain energy to them that is more conducive to our spiritual practice and, and aid us in that. There have been some people too that have tried these uh, kinds of experiments with, let's see how we're doing here. All right, so we want to end at about 15 minutes, okay. Um, <clears throat> where they, they see the effect of uh, music on uh, other living creatures like plants and animals. And it's interesting to see that various kinds of music have different effects on plants and animals. And uh, Indian music actually, especially the ragas, are, seem to have this sort of special power to, to create a, a wonderful atmosphere for other living beings. And uh, classical Western music also does very well in this regard. And so music has this ability to somehow bring in an energy beyond what we can do just with words. And that's why it's powerful to put words to music. You get the extra energy of, of both. 
the music by itself is powerful, <laughs> the words by themselves are powerful, and you put them together and you get a synergistic effect. So tomorrow night we'll have an opportunity to, to share some of that uh, in what, what I've done with the oratorio. All right, some other interesting quotes from uh, other spiritual traditions as well as our own. As we mentioned, Ramakrishna and Swami Brahmananda both strongly were affected by music. And from boyhood, uh, Swami Brahmananda was uh, strongly influenced by the songs that he would hear about the Divine Mother and Krishna. And he and his friends would go into the mango grove and sing these songs together. Uh, uh, Ramakrishna did the same thing and encouraged his disciples to sing devotional songs. And always, if anyone came that showed any musical interest or talent, he would say, you know, please share your music with us. And then he would frequently go into an exalted state hearing, hearing the music being sung. Some spiritual practices actually focus on listening for an inner current of sound or feeling like the vibrations of your mantra are like a raft carrying you across the vast ocean of the world. The ancient Buddhist scriptures also speak of the way that enlightenment comes through meditation upon an interior sound. And I have some Sikh friends that also talk about the way of the light and the sound. And their tradition emphasizes uh, visualizing both light and sound of the mantra to uh, open up their, their spiritual awareness. And uh, the, again, from the Buddhist scriptures, the Avalo. Uh, Avilokiteshwara Buddha, the hearer and answerer of prayers, has visited all the Buddha lands and has vowed to emancipate all sentient beings. How sweetly mysterious is the transcendental sound of Avilokiteshwara. It is the subdued murmur of the seed tide setting inward. Its mysterious sound brings liberation and peace to all be sentient beings who in their distress are calling for aid. Uh, in the Nata Bindhu Upanishad, it says that the sounds are always resounding in our soul. <coughs> Thus, when one attains a certain level of stillness and concentration, the spiritual sound becomes audible. And people sometimes will meditate that they hear the omkaras when they get into a deep state of meditation. Hildegard of Bingham, a famous German mystic, wrote, <coughs> To the Trinity be praised. God is music. God is life that nurtures every creature in its kind. And there was an English mystic named Richard Raleigh who said, when Christ wishes it, he receives within himself the song sent into him from the heavens, and his meditation is changed into melody, and his spirit lingers in marvelous harmony. So we have all these different mystics putting their experience in terms of sound and music. The Hazrat Inyayat Khan in the mysticism of sound says, the abstract sound fills all space. It was this sound of the abstract plane which Muhammad heard in the cave and became lost in his divine ideal. Moses heard this very sound on Mount Sinai when in communication with God. And the same word was audible to Christ when absorbed in his heavenly father in the wilderness. Shiva heard the name of An Anhad Nada during his samadhi in the cave of the Himalayas. The flute of Krishna is symbolic of the same sound. This sound is the source of all revelations to the masters to whom it is revealed from within. It is because of this that they know and teach one and the same truth. In near-death experiences, people will frequently report hearing angelic music. And one of the uh, famous visions of uh, the Virgin Mary also 
uh, involved hearing divine music. This happened in Wales. Uh, the people of the church had had a long series of prayer meetings for the revival of the church, and they seemed to not be getting anywhere. They felt like they were uh, their work was sort of fruitless. And so they began to leave the church in a state of somewhat despondency, and then they started hearing angelic voices. This indistinct but melodious sound seemed to be coming from high above the church that they had just left. The next, the next day, they discovered that many others in the district had heard the same beautiful music. Some had even gone outside to hear it and concluded it must be angelic. And soon there were hundreds flocking to the churches and experiencing uh, the prayed for outpouring of the Spirit. So it's interesting how these uh, events uh, can happen. Now another interesting connection is, as we mentioned, that music and sound is often also associated with healing. And you can do rather specific exercises to demonstrate how different sounds will affect you. There's a technique called uh, kinesiology or muscle testing where you can test uh, the strength of a particular muscle in somebody and then you can play different kinds of music and see if the strength of the muscle uh, stays the same or gets stronger or gets weaker. And again, it's shown that regardless of whether people like a particular type of music or not, that uh, much of the kind of uh, acid rock music and that type of thing is actually rather weakening to the body. Uh, but the, the more classical, both of the Indian and Western style, uh, tends to be supportive of the human energy and body and is uh, conducive to strength and resonance within the body. There was also an interesting uh, healer, talk about people that are transformed from lightning strikes. <laughs> this person was struck by lightning and afterwards she had the peculiar ability to, when she met somebody and she heard them speak, she would hear deficiencies in their vibrations. And then she, she could uh, sing those vibrations and they would feel better. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this peculiar uh, ability to sense the vibrations of the universe and how they're resonating in somebody's body just came to her spontaneously. Uh, now, of course, in a more mundane sense, now we use things like ultrasound and things to to help us heal. We use ultrasound to uh, stimulate certain areas and warm them up and loosen up muscles and things of that nature. So that's another more mundane use of sound. But uh, in the back to the spiritual realm, you've probably heard the Tibetan monks that uh, sing these rolling sounds and they've developed this technique whereby uh, concentrating on those very low tones, their voice suddenly produces these extraordinary overtones. And uh, again, this is uh, this idea that um, the whole spectrum of sounds is being produced from this fundamental tone and all of that creation is within you. You are that sound <laughs> of the universe and you are, you have all those energies within you. Uh, drumming has, there are lots of people that now are attending drumming circles and they find those healing. Different kinds of drumming patterns will be able to affect the physical states of a person and produce altered states of consciousness, transcendental states of consciousness, uh, trance states. And this, was, this is part of shamanic traditions all over the world. In the Western tradition, it's actually not very well known that some of the, the great Western compo composers 
uh, actually felt a, a deep spiritual connection to their craft and uh, uh, had a realization that there was something coming through them that wasn't <laughs> ordinary, that it uh, wasn't just that they'd studied music or that it wasn't just that they were talented, uh, but that there was something extra coming through. And uh, Brahms was actually interviewed and it's a fascinating interview. He says, <clears throat> uh, he apparently had just told this person that he feels a connection with the omnipotent uh, Godhead of the universe when he composed. And he says, how do you contact this omnipotence, the interviewer said. Uh, most people find him very aloof. Uh, and Brahms said, that is the great question. It cannot be done merely by willpower working through the conscious mind which is an evolutionary product of the physical realms and perishes with the body. Well, we had some disagreement with that. But anyway, it can only be accomplished by the soul powers within, the real ego that survives bodily death. All right, we can agree with that. <laughs> the powers are uh, quiescent to the conscious mind unless illumined by the spirit. Can you believe this is Brahm saying this? <laughs> Now, Jesus thought us, uh, taught us that God is spirit, and he also said, I and my Father are one. To realize this, that we are one with the Creator, as Beethoven did, is a wonderful and awe-inspiring experience. Uh, very few human beings ever come into that realization, and that is why there are few, so few great composers or creative geniuses in the line of human endeavor. Uh, there's a chapter in a book that I've been reading called The Irreducible Mind. There's a whole chapter on the, the phenomenon of genius and where it com comes from. Uh, <clears throat> I always contemplate all this before commencing to compose. This is the first step. When I feel the urge, I begin to directly appeal to my maker and I first ask him the three most important questions pertaining to our life here in the world, whence, wherefore, and whither. I immediately feel vibrations that thrill my whole being. These are the spiritual illumination, leading, <clears throat> excuse me, these are the spirit illuminating the soul power within. And in this exalted state, I see clearly what is obscured in my ordinary moods. Then I feel capable of drawing inspiration from above as Beethoven did. Above all, I realize at such moments the tremendous significance of Jesus' supreme revelation that I and my Father are one. Those vibrations assume the forms of distinct mental images after I have formulated my desire and my resolve in regard to what I want, namely to be inspired so that I can compose something that will uplift and benefit humanity, something of permanent value. Straight away the ideas flow in upon me directly from God. And not only do I dis see distinct themes in my mind's eye, but they are clothed in the right forms, harmonies, and orchestration. Measure by measure, the finished product is revealed to me when I am in those rare, inspired moods. So you can see that even someone steeped in the traditional Judeo-Christian tradition has this incredible insight into the nature of reality and how this creative process takes place. And it's very interesting that Brahms very seldom showed this religious side to people. In fact, some of his biographers paint him as not particularly interested in anything spiritual. <laughs> and yet when he's interviewed about his composing, this is the kind of thing he says. So then, <clears throat> I have to be in this semi-trance condition to get such results, a condition when the conscious mind is in temporary abeyance and the, what he's calling the subconscious, but I think we'd call the superconscious, is in control. For it is through the sub subconscious, again, which I call the superconscious, which is a part of the omnipotence, that the inspiration comes. And I have to be careful, however, not to lose consciousness Otherwise, the ideas fade away. So you see, there's this um, sense that in the creative process, something comes through. 
And in this book I was reading, one of their criterion for recognizing Jesus, uh, genius is that it's the effect of the creative work on other people. Uh, whether you're reading somebody's sonnet or seeing somebody's play or hearing somebody's music. If it resonates with you the way it came through the composer, you then will be able to participate in that connection that they had in this creative process, in this connection with the omnipresent uh, one, this vibrational creative energy. Uh, perhaps some of you have also heard that uh, Handel had uh, basically a transcendent experience when he composed the Messiah in an, an incredibly short period of time. I mean, I don't know how he just physically even wrote it down in that amount of time, much less dreamed it up. Uh, and again, he felt that the angels were there feeding this to him. Uh, Mozart, again, could compose faster than most people could write it down. When you look at the complete works of Johann Sebastian Bach, you wonder how anybody in any lifetime could have possibly composed that much music. Uh, it's just an astounding an amount of music. Uh, he had to produce a new cantata almost every week, <laughs> something that might take anybody else weeks to do, and he had to do it every week. So uh, truly, these musical geniuses whether it's poetry or art or music, uh, have an ability to tap into a zone where their, their mind is less of a filter <laughs> to the omnipresent vibrations of the universe and more in tune with it. And then that's why the appreciators of the art are able to respond to it. Uh, if, if you're open to those vibrations, then you can respond to it. Now, it's interesting that sometimes certain things appeal to us and certain things don't. And I think that's just because we're all starting our spiritual life from a different place. And sometimes things vibrate and sometimes they don't. It doesn't mean it's bad or you're bad. Uh, it just means that some of us need something different. Just like some people need a different diet in order to sustain their health. And so uh, it's sort of the blind men and the elephants phenomenon. We each... <laughs> are approaching things from a different angle and see things slightly differently. And so the vibrations that appeal to us might be different from what appeals to somebody else. Uh, but the, the mystery of the creation process, uh, I think if we begin to remember that it's a vibrational universe and that these energies, whether it's, whether it's a physical medium like art uh, or a, an auditory medium like music, or uh, just a thought process like a sonnet or a poem, all of those are still vibrations. They're all vibrational energies, whether they're words or pictures or sound. And all of those vibrations can be a vehicle for helping us to tap in to the mystery of the universe and take our raft across this ocean of Maya to the great beyond. So that concludes my talk. And I